All right, everybody, I'm going to get us kicked off. My name is Anna Hansen, and I am the sales director for ByteSpeed. I'm really happy to have everyone here. Thanks for taking time out of your busy day to join us. Um, you will not be disappointed. Jim is one of my uh, favorite presenters. If you can make E-Rate interesting and engaging, you really have my attention, and he does a great job. So um, if you guys want to just put any questions that you have into the chat, we will get to all of them towards the end of the presentation. Just make sure everything get, gets answered. We expect that there'll be a pretty good interactive discussion that happens at the end of the presentation. So with that, I will hand the floor over to you, Jim, and thank you for, for doing this for us today. Thanks, Anna. Thanks for having me all. Uh, so today we're gonna discuss the Emergency, Emergency Connectivity Fund, or ECF. Um, we're adding another uh, uh, three-letter acronym to our lexicon of them in our industry. But um, appreciate your attending today. Uh, thanks for ByteSpeed for uh, hosting this. Uh, so I want to pre preface this with a couple of comments. The first one is, is that I'm an E-rate consultant, but I work only with service providers and manufacturers. So I can't help you with your E-rate application. It would be illegal or conflict of interest for me to do so. But I'm here to explain what's going on. Um, again, you can take what I say with a grain of salt, given the fact that um, I support ser service providers and manufacturers in this process, but I am here to uh, hopefully disseminate as good an information as I'm aware of. Um, that being said, let's kind of take a dive. Um, so we're going to talk in kind of three phases to this process. One is um, some of the latest rules. This is impacted by the emergency connectivity fund. So I wanted to make sure kind of first and foremost, a little historical con context. Um, so within E-rate, the gift rule who was suspended under certain conditions and specifically for broadband connections or equipment for telehealth or remote learning. Um, that was extended via FCC action through June 30th. It has been further extended under the ECF. So there is still allowance for the emergency connectivity fund for the gift rule suspension, although of all other gift rules apply, i.e. the $20 in a single transaction, $50 in any single year from a single entity, not an individual, but a single entity. So um, there is a ton of money out there, as you all are well aware, for K-12 school districts and schools in general or education in general. We're gonna focus in on the last line, which is the Emergency Connectivity Fund, but just to talk about some of the allocations that are out there under the original CARES Act passed back in April of 2020, the Continuing Resolution Act that occurred in December of 2020, and then now we have the latest, which is the American Rescue Plan Act of three or March of this year. So each one of those has various funding mechanisms for schools and libraries, as well as for municipalities with, under which a local educational agency may be able to partner or take advantage of those as well. So in the CARES Act, they said purchasing one-to-one -one devices and internet service for students without laptops and Wi-Fi access, there was $13.5 billion. And on top of that, there was an additional $3.5 billion for discretionary funding for governors. And um, again, that was based on local need and discretion of the governors themselves. But a lot of money, but not as much as what's coming later. So then there was a Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021. Um, there was $900 billion in that. 81 billion of that was to remain available through the 8th of September of 2022 and managed by, by the Department of Education. Of that, 54 billion was for K-12. And again, there was another $4 billion discretionary funding, two point something billion of that was designated for private schools. In the Consolidated Appropriations Act, there was extensive definitions of what distance learning was. And again, it's dis distributed through the Title I formula which meant that uh, high poverty schools got more for, of that money. Um, and it was supporting online learning and by purchasing educational technology and internet access for students. Um, within that, the, again, they further define that as educational technology, including the hardware, software, connectivity, and assistive technology and adaptive equipment. So uh, many school districts engaged in purchasing things like uh, microphones, uh, cameras, um, some sort of speaker system in the classroom and on, for online, et cetera, to improve the distance learning environment. 
And then we come to the ARPA, or American Rescue Plan Act. And again, there's funding for Wi-Fi hotspots and devices for students without connectivity for remote learning and supporting educators in the effective use of technology. So in it, there's a total of $122 billion in relief. 7.17 billion of that 132 um, is designated for E-rate. I won't call it an E-rate 3.0 because it really isn't. It is its own emergency connectivity fund. And it's going to be under the auspices of E-rate and it's going to be kind of E-rate-like in its process, but it's very, very different in what it supports and how it goes about supporting it. So we're going to discuss that and take a deeper dive into that. So the highlights are, it's for purchases that are made in the future, i.e. starting in July for, on July 1st of 2021 through 6-30-2022. So it's going to follow the E-rate funding year or fiscal year guidelines, and it must be delivered within one year of the funding commitment decision letter. I'm not sure there's going to be an FCDL or funding commitment decision letter, but the funding commitment decision, the services have to be delivered within the year after that. School buses are eligible under this for Wi-Fi. Students, school, staff, and library patent, patrons are eligible to receive these services. So it doesn't, again, it's very uh, much to the home. It's called the homework gap, and it's for off-campus use only. We were hoping that there would be some cybersecurity eligibility in this. They declined to do that in this act or in this process. Um, so we're hoping, and we'll discuss that one at a later point in this presentation as well as what we think we can do to hopefully achieve cybersecurity eligibility under E-rate. There is no minimum bandwidth requirements. So as long as the service supports distance learning, it is eligible and, or the, supports the bandwidth necessary to engage in an active distance learning environment is kind of the way it's, it's couched. Um, it's for students who are in need. So where these services are delivered, it is for students that don't have access. So if you have access today and you're um, not in need of help with getting or gaining that access financially, you are not eligible to receive this funding. Um, so that's another kind of caveat. So that really reduces the pool of students eligible. We know that there's roughly about 20% of kids Originally, they were thinking it was 25 to 30 percent of kids in the United States didn't have decent internet access. We think that number's been pared down, and it's somewhere in the neighborhood of about 10 million kids, 20 percent of the 50 million engaged in public schools, do not have decent internet access at home to engage in distance learning. So again, it's for students or for school staff and library patrons who are in need. It will have another window in the future, depending upon funding availability, and we'll get into that one a little bit more as well. If you have purchased stuff underneath of previous acts, i.e. The, the CARES Act or the Continuing Resolution Act, or even under the, um, the uh, actual American Rescue Plan Act for the $120 billion in E-rate support, or excuse me, in K-12 support, um, then you can't use this funding for that. Now, there's some discussion about can you play the shuffle game, say, oh, I really didn't buy it with this, I actually bought it with that, and return those funds and then buy with this. Um, there is discussion about that. I would suggest that it may be a burden to hand is worth two in the bush. This is a funding process. You're going to have to certify that you didn't buy those funds or buy those uh, items with those acts or previous federal funding. So there's a subtlety to this that may engage you to not want to do that and play the shell game with the funding. Um, 471 application process, we're thinking it's going to be 471-like, and then there's going to be bear or spy invoicing in this process, and there are no competitive bidding requirements. So those are some of the highlights. We're going to take a deeper dive into most of those at some point in the future, uh, the rest of the presentation. So process. So applicants and service providers must first register for the system for award management, what's called SAM, and there's the, uh, the link, SAM.gov, where you have to create an account, much like you do have to create an account for uh, your um, build entity number or to register in the E-rate process. 
You must do that to gain payments or to process application payments for this ECF. So that's number one, and that's a differentiator. Um, your, um, your current build entity number or registration E-rate program um, doesn't help you in this process. It will help you as far as establishing uh, a um, funding process, uh, the application, the 471, if you will, um, but it does not help you as far as getting paid. So you need to register in that. Um, you need to determine the needs for students slash patrons with need. So you need to define who that is and then how you're gonna support them. There's no competitive bidding required. However, you must follow state and local procurement laws. So you're gonna certify that you do so. And if there are any that um, impact how you engage in the process then you need to follow those. Uh, the contract for services are delivered between July 1st, 2021 and June 30th, prior to the end of the filing window. So you need to engage in this um, acquisition process as soon as possible. We think the window is going to open sometime between mid to late June. So somewhere in the next 45 days, we think the window is open and it's only going to be open for 45 days. So guess that you have approximately 90 days or less to actually have engaged in a contract for these services prior to filing that Form 471-like document. Um, again, it's a Form 471-like um, and it's going to be during the 45-day window. The dates are to be determined, but probably begin sometime mid to late June. And then will require, it will require a detailed list of services, just like you do today for category two internal connections. As an example, uh, you will have to file that kind of a detailed summary of what you're buying, the unit costs, number of units, and the total eligible cost. And then again, probably something along the lines of who the support mechanism is going to, which students are actually receiving that, and that they are in fact in need, and you're going to have to certify that. The goal is for 50% of the applications funded within 60 days of the window closing. So sometime, we're guessing probably end of July, early August, um, September, October timeframe is probably, October is probably the target date for the release of the first funding commitment decisions. Um, no applications will be processed. Unlike E-rate, where oftentimes they start to actually issue uh, funding commitment decision letters immediately following the close of the window, they're going to tabulate this whole thing and see if they can op up, open up a second window and how they're going to go about funding this. And because they're not sure of what's going to happen, they're kind of um, holding their cards close to the vest for a little bit longer. Um, there's going to be either bear or spy invoicing. And a unique thing about this program is the in invoicing window will open 15 days after the 471 window closes, which is going to be pretty rapid um, uh, thing. And saying that there, so immediately after you've received a funding commitment decision letter, you're gonna be able to turn around an invoice. That will allow you to gain the funding prior to paying the service provider which is unique. E-rate, the deal is, is that if you file what's called a build entity application for reimbursement, Form 472, you must pay the service provider prior to doing so. In this case, that is not so. You can request the funds ahead of paying the service provider. However, you must pay the service provider within 30 days of the receipt of those funds. So the Emergency Connectivity Fund process for awards. Um, if the demand exceeds availability, then we'll, awards will be based on the category one discount structure or percentages. We're all pretty familiar with that. If you apply for E-rate, um, there's a slight twist to that. They're giving a 5% increase to rural applicants. So if you have a 90% E-rate discount, the highest level of discount for E-rate, and this thing falls over out of the 100% funding, in other words, greater than $7.17 billion are requested during the application process, then they're going to fall back to an E-rate-like scenario where they pay based on the discount percentages. Rural applicants are going to have an advantage over urban applicants, which is kind of unusual. It's not necessarily the case at the higher discount levels within E-rate. That is not the case with the ECF. So a 95% discount is gonna be the highest level of discount if they have to go to that. 
if there is, um, if the demand does not exceed the 7.17, then it's going to be 100% funding regardless of your discount level. So that's a little bit unique. Um, again, it's 100% discount. This is only in the case where they exceed the funding level requests or the funding requests exceed the funding availability. Um, and again, if demand exceeds funds available at a specific discount group, in other words, let's say they could go down to 70% discount levels. Well, at that point, at the 70% and below, let's say you have a 69.5% discount level, or um, you qualify, let's say you qualify for a 70% discount, but you only have a 50% free and reduced lunch, as in the discount matrix for E-rate, then um, one of your neighboring districts might have a 55% discount, still only qualify for a 75 or 70% 70 discount. They would get the funding ahead of you. So a little bit unique in that regard, but uh, again, we're hoping that that doesn't happen given the parameters of the program at this point. Again, if funding is available after the first round, in other words, they don't consume all 7.17 billion, then there will be a second window announced. And that will be for retroactive purchases. So if you used other than, if you use general funds, for instance, or operating funds to purchase gear that's eligible under the program prior to July 1, 2021, then that, pro, then that window, second window would be for your applications. So what is and isn't eligible? Again, school buses are eligible. Cybersecurity did not get into the eligibility mix on this one. Cell phones are not eligible, although wireless data plans are eligible. Fixed broadband connections are eligible. Wi-Fi hotspots, modems, routers, air cards, and combinations of a router and a modem are eligible. There are a couple of little nuances to that rule. There's only one Wi-Fi hotspot eligible per user. So if you're going to give a Wi-Fi hotspot to a kid to take home, each kid can get one. But if you're sending them home a Wi-Fi router modem device that's capable of supporting more than one user simultaneously, it's only one device per location. Laptops and notebooks are eligible as endpoint devices. And then self-provisioned networks are marginally eligible. So if you're talking to, uh, considering PLTE or CBRS or something along those lines as a, a fixed wireless solution then uh, and, and private at that, then it's marginally eligible and we'll take a lot, dive into that one as well. So here's the list and the funding levels for eligible services. So connected devices, what we're calling laptops and tablet computers, are eligible up to $400. So if you spend more than $400, which you're um, perfectly free to do, uh, you can get $400 reimbursement for those devices. No desktop computers and cell phones are eligible under this thing again, and you're not allowed to buy spares. So break fix um, is not a part of this, um, and a one-time $400 per student or per need, student in need. Wi-Fi hotspots, very specific. Wi-Fi hotspots are eligible up to $250. It's a pretty expensive Wi-Fi hotspot at that point. So um, that's surprising if you exceed that, but you are allowed to, again, exceed that. They'll support it up to $250. And then modems, routers, including cellular air cards and devices that combine a modem and a router do not have a cap on them which is also kind of good news for certain types of devices out there that are um, a little bit more robust than just your standard Wi-Fi hotspot. School buses and devices and connectivity, there is no cap on that. There, um, although uh, with each of these, you will find that there is a reasonableness test that is, um, uh, allows the FCC and USAC to look at these and say, hey, this is way outside the boundaries of good taste. And then again, connectivity, data plans, et cetera. Again, that reasonable test reviewed by the FCC and USAC. They are estimating that these data plans are somewhere between, between 10 and $25 per month. But again, there is no cap on that. Um, emergency connectivity fund for self-provision networks. This is both for um, wide area network uh, 
type uh, fiber networks, um, you know, uh, self-provisioned fiber networks, as well as wireless networks that are self-provisioned. Very limited circumstances, but it is eligible. So there's no competitive bidding requirements, again, other than state and local procurement laws. You have to demonstrate with clear evidence that there were no commercially available internet access service options sufficient to support remote learning from one or a combination of providers. And then you must certify that you sought service and that the providers were unable or unwilling to provide broadband and internet access services. And this is the important part, sufficient to meet the remote learning needs of their students, school staff, or library patrons. So if you have service, but it doesn't work, in other words, a kid can take a Wi-Fi hotspot home and it doesn't meet the needs of a distance learning application, interactive learning, then they don't have service. And therefore you could provision or self-provision a network capable of supporting that service. Again, it's going to be trial and error. We all know what this really looks like. When all is said and done with the carriers, you say, we've got coverage everywhere, when in reality, they don't. And so the onus of proof is on you. The A, it attempted to engage with service providers, one, and two, that there were not provisioned capabilities for them to actually meet the needs of the students in that particular geographic location. I would suggest that uh, this is doable. However, you're going to be highly scrutinized during the process. And this is my interpretation. It has to be implemented with a year, within a year of the funding commitment decision. And you're going to need to demonstrate geographic and demographic coverage during the process, as well as how you did this outreach. And I think it's going to be more, more than just a phone call to say, hey, can you do this? It's going to need to be clear evidence. So emails back and forth, re, uh, document retention, and proof that they were not able to provide service in that particular serving area. So some of the miscellaneous things that uh, came out in this process. There is a 10-year documentation retention requirement, just like E-rate. Again, the gift rule waiver has been extended for gifts associated with distance learning. There is SIPA requirements will be in place when both the device and connectivity are provided through ECF. There is some question mark about the interpretation of this particular section, but um, suffice it to say that it's, it's less, require, less of a requirement for the libraries, but certainly for the schools. I would say that you need to have some level of SIPA compliance, both in the device and the um, end user device, as well as the network device that you're providing to your schools and libraries. There must be a user assigned credentials required for access to these devices. And a very strange one, non-traditional off-campus locations are eligible where education is taking place. This means that community centers, churches, um, learning areas, um, yes, other places where there is um, some sort of educational environment taking place, you can extend to them, A, and B, no on-campus service. So this is not a supplement to E-rate category two internal connections for on-campus service. This is strictly for off-campus. So now we're going to take kind of a, a, a turn here and talk a little bit about non-education funding sources within the American Rescue Plan Act. Um, so there were numerous other things. And I like to think that uh, as you look at this, look at it from a holistic process standpoint or a holistic funding standpoint. I don't think you're going to be able to get from point A to point B where we have 100% uh, homework gap coverage in this, in this country without multiple funding sources at your disposal. And there are several out there to get there from here, um, besides just the ECF and some of the um, ESSER funds that are available. There's the Economic Development Administration, Department of Commerce. Um, again, uh, through September of 2022, there's $3 billion. There's a Capital Projects Fund through the Department of the Treasury. 
That SUP funding is going to be start eligible, being available to be applied for this coming summer. Um, I have a link to it later on in, um, with a lot of these funding sources. I have some links for you and some resources for you as well. But there's $10 billion, and specifically, this can be utilized for uh, deployment of networks. There's the State Fiscal Recovery Fund. That had $220 billion for investments in water, sewer, or broadband. Sounds mutually exclusive, but uh, in effect, um, you can gain broadband funding for the local LEAs as well as for the state and from the states to do this, as well as the local fiscal recovery fund. There was $130 billion there, again, for um, sewer, water, and broadband infrastructure. And then the local assistance and tribal consistency fund had a half a billion, um, again, for 2022 and 2023 for tribal use for any governmental purpose other than lobbying activity. These can be used in any combination with other funding sources. Again, you can't buy, you can't double dip, you can't buy a Wi-Fi hotspot um, from one and um, then look for funding for that same Wi-Fi hotspot from another, but you can get the Wi-Fi hotspot from one and then the monthly service from another. So. Uh, mixing and matching these funds, I think, is going to be a little tricky, but doable. So here are some of the resources and initiatives. Uh, one of the things that I like to do is um, encourage the E-rate community, and particularly the end user community, to uh, support act, uh, initiatives and um, activism, if you will, let's call it E-rate activism. This one is particularly um, important in this day and time, given all of the ransomware problems that are going on in this country, um, with uh, particularly with public agencies, uh, allowing complete cybersecurity as an eligible service in E-rate is important. If you click on that link, it will take you to the FCC filings, and all you need to say is is that please make cybersecurity 100% E-rate eligible. Literally, if you click on the link and actually go to submit a comment, uh, you will be done in uh, literally a minute and a half to two minutes. It, it, that's all it takes. And the more folks that do that, the greater likelihood is we're gonna have cybersecurity as an E-rate eligible service. There is money in the current E-rate program to do so, and we really encourage you to do it. Um, here's a link from an education superhighway, well-respected organization that's committed to um, in, engaging and providing uh, broadband to education. Uh, they have a matrix for the federal funding for all of the funding that's available within the federal government today for broadband and E-rate type applications. And then what's coming on the horizon, we see an additional funding for broadband. Um, the Democratic version has $100 billion as part of the, um, uh, the infrastructure bill that's in, this, uh, in the House and Senate and being floated around. Um, uh, Representative Clyburn and Senator Klobuchar, um, and supported by the president, um, had a $100 billion standalone, and that's been kind of sucked into the uh, infrastructure bill. The Republican version had about $60 billion in the last version that I saw. Well, remains to be seen how this thing falls out, but we're hopeful that, again, this will support several initiatives within E-rate. Ongoing support for Wi-Fi on school buses being an important one. Um, prevent the FCC from placing an overall cap on the Universal Service Fund, which would cap E-rate, and then fund gigabit broadband for all anchor institutions, again, schools, libraries, healthcare institutions, that sort of thing, and then networks to be open and accessible. So with that, I um, thank you for your time, and I'd like to open it up for any questions. Thank and you so much, Jim. We've got some good ones here, so I'm just going to kind of go down the list. Uh, the first one is network expansion on eligible it, or is network expansion eligible if the first phase deployment was funded by CARES? Um, so again, if you funded it through CARES and then you are doing a network expansion, uh, the expansion would be eligible as long as it's defined and eligible under this program. Yes. That's perfect. How would lease, leased equipment be handled? Um, so if you engage in a lease, then I would suggest it would be a very short-term lease because, again, this service needs to be delivered within a year. This is an emergency act. This is not designed to be a long-term process, and you're going to be fully funded. So 
Um, I don't think you can, I don't think it's really a good idea to try and lease it, or if it is, it's just a, um, I would call it bridge financing to an actual end payment. Do data plans for hotspots, uh, including SIPA compliance filtering, add an extra charge? Like, can you do a data plan if it includes and get the SIPA compliance funded, or is that not eligible for funding? Again, SIPA compliance is never funded under these programs because that's the responsibility of the applicant. So it would be your responsibility to pay for the SIPA compliant portion. Okay. Um, and then there was a question on, does that mean you can buy a bus or is that just the devices for the bus? <laughs> Worth a try. I think that's Good very try. novel. Um, uh, not the bus, but just the um, Wi-Fi access on the bus for the students riding on that bus. Okay. And then this is somewhat of a repeat. Does this pay for filtering, which I believe you just answered. Um, and then I can we paste those links into the chat? That's a good idea. I'll actually send a follow up with all of this too via email. So if you've registered, you'll get a follow up uh, email with the with the slide deck and everything called out on it. Um, one of the questions was projectors and touchscreen interactive boards in the classroom. Would those be eligible? No. Okay. Um, I'm going to switch over but to the chat. They, but again, that's that's why I say you're going to need to take a pretty holistic approach to that. This is very specific to what is eligible. That would absolutely be eligible under the American Rescue Plan Act for the ESSER funding for any okay. one of the three acts, frankly. Okay, I'm gonna ask another one. Is there only going to be a one-time purchase or could we expect this funding every year? We don't know. Um, if this becomes a part of the uh, infrastructure bill um, as planned for, uh, we're, we're hopeful for, then I would say that this can become an ongoing process. But at this point, this is a one-time shot. So this, this is a really good question. When will we start gathering quotes from vendors for items? Would this be before the window opens so we can be ready to apply? Or is there a restriction like there is with E-rate? There is no restriction that we're aware of at this point in time. Um, I would say that's a to be determined, but I would recommend moving forward on any process that you have engaged in right now and be prepared to file. And we all know what public sector acquisition process looks like. If you have to take it to your board, those kinds of things and scheduling that, we're going to um, approach summertime board schedules. All those kinds of issues are going to rear their ugly head. So my recommendation is to get this done and engaged as rapidly as possible and just keep your eye on the window opening. This is a, this is a pretty good example from someone. We have a free and reduced lunch percentage of 80% and we bought 3,000 Chromebooks using some federal and some local funds. We now have a need to buy a thousand more to replace those that are at the end of life. Would this be allowable based on your interpretation? Yes, okay. that's absolutely what this is designed for. This is an interesting one. Uh, would you be able to driver pay for wi delivery Wi-Fi? So could you pay for bus drivers? The drivers themselves, mm, no, but they're, they are school staff. And if the driver, for instance, was carrying a Wi-Fi hotspot on his route that was accessible by students while they're on the buses, you could make that their school staff and you can make an argument for that. Yeah. That's an interesting interpretation or idea, actually. Um, how do you determine if staff. how do you determine if students are eligible for the services? If we're not a one-to-one -one school, then are all students eligible? No, it's on need. Does a student at home have access to good internet? If not, then they are in need and th therefore they qualify for the service. Um, most school districts, most school entities that I'm aware of right now have a pretty good ha handle on who does and who doesn't have decent internet access for distance learning at home. So um, that's what you should base this on, actual need of the student at home. How long would phone or hotspot data plans be covered and paid for? We know for a fact for the next year. That's it. Would something like a district private LTE network qualify? Yeah, and that was our discussion on self-provision networks. If you can, in fact, with in good conscience say, we've gone out to our vendor community and you can prove that you've done outreach to them and gotten back, no, we can't provide service there, and you put up a private LTE, yes, it's eligible. Okay. Do we still need two quotes and such? No, there is no competitive bidding requirement other than if your state or local procurement laws require it, 
then yes. But for as for the purposes of E-rate, this particular ECF E-rate funding, there is no four four seventy competitive bidding um, RFP requirements at all. They're they're throwing really great ones at. I got still got a pile coming at you. So, <laughs> are we able to work with our local ISP to get internet access to those students that don't have internet access? Yes, you are, and encouraged to do so. Awesome. If we have a July 1st PO for the Chromebooks already on file with our vendor, will that PO qualify? So in other words, you've already engaged in a contract with your, um, was that prior to April 1st of 2021? If it was prior or past, then I'm gonna say it's probably not eligible and you really need to either go back out and renegotiate that um, PO uh, I'm not sure, but it's for services delivered after July 1, 2021. So if it wasn't invoiced? If you're con I would say it depends on when you contracted for it and when the delivery of the services is going to occur. And ag again, this is very what I would call amorphous or jello like. We're not sure what's going to wash out in the end as far as all the subtleties of some of these rules. Uh, this thing just came out on the 10th, so it's only a week old. And we anticipate that there's going to be some clarifications issued and those kinds of things. So the answer is, I would, I would suspect that if you engage in a contract within the recent past, but after April 1 of 2021, and for services to be delivered after July 1, 2021, that you're probably going to be okay. What about hotspots that were originally obtained with CARES? Can we apply for additional yearly coverage to be applied through the ECF funds? So um, if you're just applying for the service and that service is going to be between July 1st, 2021 and June 30th, 2022, I believe the answer would be yes. But not for the hotspots themselves, just for the ser monthly service. Okay. Right. A school with 15% free and reduced doesn't sound like they have much of a shot for these funds. How confident are you funds would be available for our district? We just don't know is the answer. I wish I was confident. Um, they've, um, I, so based on, some, let me, let's go back to this, based on some of the questions and based on Jim Kerr's uh, suppositions and kind of background and history in this program, I think that it's gonna come close, but I think it's gonna be available 100%. That's what I think. Now, I could be all wrong and you know, we'll, people are gonna come looking for me later on down the road, I hope not, but um, I'm hopeful. I would say this is one of those ones where if you don't apply and it is available, you're gonna be really unhappy. And if it turns out that the um, funds aren't available, you did your best and that's all you can do as a um, kind of a steward of the fiduciary responsibilities for your organization, I would highly recommend you apply and see what happens. Uh, yeah. As opposed to E-rate, you'd be kind of crazy not to apply for this because nobody really knows how it's gonna shake out and you could you could be fully funded. Yep, and you know, that's 7.17 billion. Let's put, let's put it this way. E-rate's 2.5 billion. It has Plus a $4 billion funding cap, but really, there's only about three or $2.5 billion requested in funding. So there's plenty of money in the E-rate program. And granted, they've skinnied that down um, based on no voice communications being eligible, but I believe that there's gonna be a significant funding available. And even if at 50%, I would say the 20 and 30, 40%ers are probably gonna have a rough time of it. But if you're at a 50% discount level, that means you have what a 30% or 20% free and reduced lunch. Uh, I'd say the odds are pretty good you're going to get funded. That's awesome. If we lease Chromebooks, could we apply for reimbursement for that lease payment? I don't know. All I know is that you can only apply for the payments for um, the one year. So if you have a three year lease on a Chromebook and you're looking to pay it off, um, you know, then maybe but you're only given a $400 payment maximum. Um, I, would, I would say that you need to look at your contract. You should have a line item price tag for those Chromebooks. And if you can uh, get, you receive them in the past, then it's not eligible period. If you're contracting for new Chromebooks uh, within the last 30, less than 30 days, for instance, um, then you're probably gonna be eligible and I wouldn't lease them, I'd buy them. 
Okay, does that statement on at home mean only for distance learning during the regular day or can they receive normal schooling at school and be covered by this after, after the school is over? Yes, the answer is covered after school. That's the whole idea, the homework gap. All right. Uh, one of our districts is saying he has a SAMGov account already. Will he need a separate one for this process? I would um, watch this space. I don't think you need to reapply for a SAM.gov account, uh, reapply. But uh, again, we don't know what the requirements of this program are or what your registration level is within SAM.gov. I'm frankly not familiar with it. Um, we've started to do a little research on it um, within our organization so that we can advise our clients. But again, that's something that's kind of a watch this space. I would begin the registration process if you already have an account and just be um, attuned to what's going on in the program. Right. So ordering hotspots to have on hand, can we claim those or just the ones that are actually in use? Just the ones that are in use, no spares. Can you please clarify that E-rate currently covers in-bus Wi-Fi? Earlier slide said it was E-rate eligible, but the last slide said it waiting on E-rate approval. Okay, so ECF eligible, not E-rate eligible. Again, this ECF is not E-rate um, and E-rate is not ECF. So the Emergency Connectivity Fund has school buses as eligible. They did not, as a part of the record, make school buses permanently eligible under the E-rate program. So that's the distinction. You, I'm gonna put you on the spot, Jim. With your crystal ball, do you think that E-rate will cover buses eventually? Yes. So. But you guys remember that this is a crystal ball prediction. <laughs> what about Please. providing a cellular access point for a parking lot or general area wireless access for students to come to use for access? So um, that is not um, eligible because it's considered on campus for E-rate and that would fall under E-rate under community use. So there was a relaxation of the community use rule that said if you provide a Wi-Fi access hotspot, whatever, um, in the parking lot so the parents could roll their kids in after school or the parents could come in and look even you know, a guest access for job hunting or whatever that might be, applying for some funding or whatever, that's called community use and that is eligible currently under E-rate rules. And so you can do it that way. And also under several CARES funding sources yes. too. Yeah. If we purchased Chromebooks last year, can this funding be used to cover those previous costs or is this only for purchases within the upcoming year? It's only for purchases in the upcoming year at this point. Again, if funding is eligible or if there's funding left over, this full 7.17 is not requested, then there will be a second window that will be open shortly after the first window once they determine what the ask is. This is a good question. Are all school bus routes deemed eligible? Or are they only the ones that serve underserved areas or areas where there are more students with need for connectivities within the district? It's not defined. And so uh, here's my take on it. And I've been a proponent for making school buses eligible. If you remember, there was a, um, uh, a petition put out um, probably four or five years ago I, I was driving that process. I've been a big proponent of school buses. There are 480,000 school buses in the United States. 26 million kids roughly ride a school bus every single day. The average bus ride is somewhere close to an hour on a national basis. There is no reason to not utilize that time as an educational opportunity, as well as for safety reasons, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, that's, that's the reasoning. There is no discussion within the order about which school bus is and is not eligible or how it is eligible. Strictly that it is school buses are eligible. End of statement. I love it. What would that proof on not available bandwidth from the service provider be? An email, a letter, any recommendations there? Um, as long as it's not a conversation that's memorialized by a you know, handwritten note, I would say, um, actually reaching out and saying, hey, we need coverage in this specific area to this level of service. In other words, if I send a student home with a Wi-Fi hotspot for that location and they can engage in distance learning, and I see a later question that says, um, you know, what is considered, um, you know, acceptable bandwidth requirements. There are no bandwidth requirements other than you can successfully engage 
in distance learning. So an interactive session. So somewhat open to interpretation there. Yep, again, open to interpretation. So we have students that are not on free and reduced lunch, but the parent insists they cannot afford the internet. Is an email or note from this parent stating this sufficient evidence? Sure. As long as you believe it and you're buying it, that's, that's up to you. All right. Um, we will absolutely provide the link to view this recording later. Everyone that registered will automatically get a, um, a, an email from me with the recording and, and, several, and the slide deck as well. Uh, we have students that are not on free and reduced lunch, but the parent did, uh, got that already answered there. Um, the safety of the students with laptops open come into questions if there's an accident. Is that not a concern for, I'm assuming, for bus Wi-Fi? Um, I'm not a discussion. I, I'm not sure how to approach that one. Um, yeah. Probably probably not one we, we want to dig into. I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm not qualified to discuss um, personal injury. I'm not a personal injury attorney. <laughs> <laughs> well, so we'll keep to the, we'll keep to the funding. We do not have a take home one-to-one -one device program. Should we still be pursuing this for devices? That's up to you. Again, if, um, if the students don't have access to decent um, uh, capabilities at home. In other words, they, you may not have a one-to-one -one program on a district-wide basis, but there's definitely students in need. I'm not sure aware of any districts in this country that don't have some students in need at some point. Um, I think it's incumbent upon us to provide um, as much of a level of access to, to uh, create, uh, no, well, to delete the div digital divide, get rid of it. Um, it's uh, whatever you can do to do so within the confines of any of these programs, I, I'm, I'm a fan of. So other than that, legally, how you go about doing that, um, that's a whole different discussion and one that you have to approach internally within your particular LEA, but uh, um, I would encourage you to do so. So this is referring to a community parking lot, not a school parking lot. For example, if you go and set up a wireless hotspot at the courthouse, fire department, uh, maybe a park or some other safe places where kids can get internet access in the community, would that be eligible? I believe it would be. So as long as that, that is designated as a some sort of a learning environment, okay? In other words, um, you know, you have a covered space in a park that, or like a little community center in the park and you set up a Wi-Fi hotspot or uh, probably a Wi-Fi hotspot is not probably going to do it, but um, a little bit more ro robust of a device and internet connectivity for that location and designated as an after-school homework location for kids in need, absolutely it's eligible. Awesome. What if we have students that have internet connection at home but do not own a computer? I'm not um, sure. Again, this, this gets into policy discussions within your local educational agency. Um, you know, this is des designed for people, libraries, for instance, can provide a patron without much documentation with a device and a hotspot or combination thereof. So a device that has Wi-Fi access and, you know, is under 400 bucks and if you can do it, I, I'm encouraging you to do so. Again, there's all kinds of um, you know, haves versus have nots kind of policy issues that get you get into with LEAs that haven't engaged in one to one. But if there's a student in need, this is certainly designed to help that kid. So please. Yeah. So if funding requests total 10.5 billion, can you clarify how this would get dispersed? So they're going to start with 95% districts and disseminating 95% districts first, then 90%, then 85, and then 80 percenters. And I'll go down from there until they exhaust the funds. But the minute that they start doing things like saying, okay, 95 percenters are going to get funded first, that means that automatically they just knocked off 5%, and at 90%, it's 10%. So suddenly um, you get down to the 80%, you're discounting 20% of the overall program and, you know, and go down from there. Uh, that would probably utilize the entire program, but you would get to funding across the board at a discount level as opposed to 100% funding. With supply and demand restraints along with the fact that most schools begin ordering equipment now to avoid this, how quickly do you anticipate schools being told they were funded? The, the requirement is 
50% of all workable applications within 60 days of the deadline of the funding window or the window. So let's say again, I would estimate that to be sometime if the filing window closes, uh, let's say uh, sometime in, um, let's say August, as the filing window closed, we go through late June and through July into early August, then we have 60 days from that date. So we're talking sometime early October would be the first funding commitment decisions. Could they pre-order and still and be reimbursed through the bear form if they pre-ordered after the window was open? Yes. So once they file, okay, and the window closes, they can start applying for funding um, 15 days after the window closes. And as soon as they get their funding commitment decision, they can go ahead and get their reimbursement. And then they just have to pay the service provider within 30 days of receipt of the reimbursement. But can they order before they're approved? Say they're going to sure. do the project anyway. Yes. You if can order before anyway, you approve. Absolutely. Yes. Kind of like, um, go ahead. It's kind of like, like e rate. Yeah, where you can, um, you know, apply and then start implementing April 1st on category one or category two internal connections, as an example. If a school purchases extra devices and the devices become used by a student, are they then eligible for reimbursement? I would say probably not. <laughs> I don't know. Is it, uh, mm -hmm. answer is I don't know for sure. But think about it. If you purchased it for one purpose and then you're repurposing it for another purpose and it was used for the original purpose originally, probably not. Yeah. Can you highlight the process to apply again? Sure. Um, let me go here. Yeah, let me see where, oh, let's see. Back to my screen again so I can share here. Let's see here. I'm not sure why I'm not going back to that screen, but here, let me do this. Okay, and then start sharing again. Okay, so and I'm not sure how uh, let's see what I'm doing here. I'm not sure why this is not coming back up again on Zoom, but we'll get there. We will get there, folks. Okay. There we go. Hey, all right. So applicants and service providers, again, register in the system for award management. Um, I would suggest you need to, you know, if you haven't already done so, you need to survey your students and find out who's actually in need. Um, and my, uh, my unprofessional office mate is scratching at my door because I got it closed so I can, you can't hear her who is a small dog. Um, uh, determine needs for students and patrons um, with need. Obviously, go ahead and find out you know, who needs the services. And then you don't need to engage in competitive bidding processes, but you must follow state and local procurement laws. Contract for the services to be delivered between July 1st and June 30th. That doesn't mean you, the, the services have to be delivered during that time frame. You can contract earlier for those services, just not delivered before April 30th. So you can't have already contracted and started receiving services prior to April 30th. This is for services delivered between July 1, 2021 and June 30th, 2022. Then file what's called, what's going to be a 471 like, I don't think it's gonna be called a form 471, but something like a form 471. And then during that 45 day window, we don't know what the dates are, but we think it's gonna open up sometime in late, mid to late June. And then it will close obviously at the end of July, early August. It will re require a detailed list of services in the application um, for review, just like a PIA process for review. 
Um, in E-rate, there's going to be something similar to that, and you're going to actually have to show a contract. You're going to have to show the actual services and a detailed list of those services, a la bill of materials, that sort of thing. And then 50% of the applications will be funded within 60 days of window closing. Um, again, no applications will be processed until after the window has closed and total dollars of all applications have been determined. When you engage in bear or spy invoicing. If you want to pay your percentage and ask your service provider to participate in the process, uh, you can do what's called SPI or service provider invoicing. And then invoicing window will open 15 days after the 471 window closes. Um, there's, you won't know if you're going to get funded. Um, you can apply for the invoicing. Um, obviously, it's, invoicing is going to lag behind funding commitment decision letter. And there's going to be a review process in the invoicing as well. So that at that point, um, they're also of note is service providers are going to be required to submit you know, during spy invoicing detailed invoices. So just be aware that they're, they're going to try and, um, as opposed to the RFP process and competitive bidding rules at E rate, they're going to try and eliminate any waste, fraud, and abuse by, um, I think, some significant documentation requirements. While you uh, have that slide deck up, just one of the next questions is on, can you pull up slide 14? Um, can we use this process to pay a local internet provider to provide service for students who need it? And is there a price cap? Which I know you have on. Uh, let's see here. So let's see, are we talking about, let's see here. I think we're talking about this slide right here, correct? Yep. Um, yep. So with this slide, um, a, um, a Wi-Fi hotspot up to 250 bucks and then the connectivity, the data plans, um, et cetera, are estimated in the document, the, what's called report and order from the FCC. They say, we see these things at 10 to $25, but if an agency is, can't engage in bulk purchases, for instance, et cetera, et cetera, doesn't have access to consortium purchasing requirements, et cetera, then um, they may be higher than that. They're just not sure. And so there's the reasonableness test. I mean, if you come back and say, hey, it's going to be $85 a month, well, that starts to sound like um, uh, your local cable television connection with an internet access, and that's probably not going to fly. So just word to the wise, be, be cautious and be conservative in your, in, in your process. Love it. And then it looks like possibly our last question here. Are only the devices purchased for free and reduced students eligible for funding under this program? and devices for students that are not free and reduced would be the responsibility of the district. It kind of reads that way, it's, but it's applicants, or the, the end user, it must be in need, all right? It doesn't define what that need is. So if you have a kid that's on the borderline, he doesn't qualify for free and reduced lunch, but let's say he's 1% above the poverty level, um, or 125% of the poverty level is defined by the National School Lunch Program, and he's at 126%. So I would say that that kid probably is in need and, and give it to him, or homeless or whatever. Um, you know, that's, um, there, there's a variety of ways to determine that need. And I think that's up to the individual district, as long as it's not, um, I would, you know, you hate to say these things, but, you know, as long as you're not giving kids in Beverly Hills 90210 um, blanket um, access kind of thing, you're probably okay. All right. Well, um, Jim, thank you, as always. Like I said, anybody that can uh, maneuver through E-Rate as well has, uh, has my vote. <laughs> really appreciate it. And if you guys have any extra questions, I will send out this recording. Shoot me a message. I'll do my best to answer. And uh, definitely keep in touch with Jim. So. Thanks, y'all. Thanks for your time. Have a great day. Thank you, guys.